Okay, so uh, welcome to the hopefully last lecture today. So I intend to finish all the core material for the in terms of the theory part today. All right, so um, just a note regarding the midterm. If you haven't read your email already, I encourage you to do so from now on. But uh, if, if you've noticed, I've reduced the total of the midterm from 90 down to 55 because the uh, average in the midterm was unfortunately very poor, and that wasn't my intention. So uh, I reduced it so that I made the average hovering about 75 or so, which is acceptable for a third year course. Okay. So, uh, so instead of your marks being out of 90, they're out of 55. So on the actual paper, it says 90, but on D2L, it'll say out of 55. Okay? So for those students who actually exceeded 55, those marks will be transferred over to the finals. So you can think of those as bonus marks. So for example, if you got 65 out of 55, then you get an extra 10 marks applied to your final as a bonus, okay, if that carries over. And if you still happen to get you know, more than perfect on your final, then I'll take your marks and spread them evenly amongst your labs. Okay? So I'll try to be as fair as I can. All right. Also, I've made the additional uh, the additional constraint, or not constraint, but the additional bonus, where if you did really, really bad on your midterm, and supposing you do really good on your final, then I will ignore your midterm completely. So your theory portion will only be based on your final exam mark only. Okay, so that that is in case you do really, really bad on the midterm. So, and either way, I will try to make it so that you have the best theoretical mark possible. For your, you know, for the theory part. So, for example, let's say you did unfortunately bad on the final exam as well. So I'll choose the higher of the two, whether I just, you know, I wait your midterm and average, you know, midterm and final as is, or just wait your final by itself. So either way, I will choose whichever combination gives you the highest mark. All right. So that'll that that is my message for you. Okay. Uh, any questions about that before? I... Actually, so what I'll do is um. People who are writing their makeup are going to write tomorrow, so then I will mark them as quickly as I can, and then you will actually get your physical copies of your midterms on Wednesday. And then you can come see me in my office hours anytime after that point if you want to actually collect a physical copy of your midterm. Okay? And then I'll also post solutions online after the uh, makeup students write theirs, so you can actually see what the actual correct answers are, all right, as well as the marking scheme. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to cover, uh, and unfortunately, uh, Exciting or not exciting topic today. You probably thought that uh, seeing probability and random processes last semester, you're probably saying, okay, I'm never going to see this stuff again, but unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, especially when you're taking a look at communication systems, random processes and probability are a big, uh, they form a big part of analysis of communication systems, mainly because noise is a random signal. So you have to know a little bit about random processes and probability before you decide to do. Uh, the next part of the course, which is analyzing noise and communication systems. Okay, so this part of the lecture is going to be talking just a brief review of what you know in, in, from Math 514 or probability and random processes, and for just a review. And I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page before we actually get onto the meat of what we're going to talk about, which is noise analysis and performance in communication systems. All right. So let's start from the very beginning. So what exactly is a random variable? All right. So if you remember. Uh, you have some sort of experiment where the outcome of that experiment cannot be determined beforehand. So a good example would be tossing a dice or flipping a coin or randomly choosing some toy or something out of a bin. All right. So the, the outcome cannot be predetermined, but they can come from a set of possible outcomes. Okay. So what a random variable does is that it takes random events. So for example, an event would be flipping heads or flipping tails or flipping a three or a six for a die. So that particular outcome is an event. So a random variable is to map every event that is possible in your set to a real number. Okay, so for example, let's take a look at, you know, tossing a coin that is fair, assuming that it's fair. All right, so we're going to let capital X be a random variable, and that will denote what the actual outcome of your toss is going to be. So usually we let X equals zero, meaning that you flipped heads, and X equal one, meaning that you flipped tails. Okay, so if it's fair, that means that it's you got a 50-50 chance to flip whether you have heads or tails. So the probability of you flipping a heads so or the probability of x being 0 is simply 0.5 or a half, right? And if you flip tails, then it's simply going to be 0.5 as well. So we either, you know, you're the, the event of you seeing x is equal to 0, with this, which is heads, or x is equal to 1, which is tails, both of them are equal to 0.5, all right? Similarly, if you wanted to toss a six-sided die, right, you know, a cube is six sides, then the probability of flipping, you know, one, two, three, four, five, or six is going to be equal to one over six, assuming it's fair, right? And then you can map the numbers from one to six to a random variable x, which denotes, you know, the, which number you flipped on the dice. Okay. 
So you take an event from an experiment that has some sort of probability. In our case, we've, you know, we've mapped it to be one half if you're flipping a coin or one over six if you're flipping a die, right? And then you're going to take this event and map it to a real number. That's what I talked about. So x is equal to zero or one for coins or one to six for a die, all right? So in practice, when you have a random variable, you usually repeat this experiment a very large number of times, all right? So flipping a coin like maybe 10 times is not a good indication of how often you're going to see heads or how often you're going to see tails. You usually repeat it hundreds or even thousands of times if you want. Okay? So for these outcomes, we actually determine what's known as a PDF or a probability distribution function. And a PDF basically tells you, it gives you an indication of how often you will see a particular outcome in your experiment. Okay? So for a random variable x, this is defined, the PDF is defined as f sub x, which is a function of x. Okay? So this small x is some event that happened on the, you know, on the actual random variable x. So for example, f of x of 0 would be the probability that you've rolled a heads, and f of x of 1 is the probability that you rolled a tails, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this PDF, it gives you some sort of indication of how likely particular events in a random variable are going to happen. So usually, if it's fair, then if you have a, you know, a six-sided die, so f of x from 1 to 6 should give you 1 over 6 for each outcome. Okay, so very, very simple. We're just starting from random variables and then slowly transitioning to more advanced stuff. But this is this should be review, but I'm going as slow as I can. All right? So what is a random process? So we've talked about random variables, very straightforward. What is a random process? Here's a little bit of a, of a mind job. So it's basically a random variable that varies over time. So it's a little messed up, but if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. All right? So if you have a random variable, one event gets mapped to a single number. So if you wanted to roll a heads or a tails, they can map to 0 or 1. If you wanted to roll a die, it goes from 1 to 6. All right? With a random process, each outcome is actually a function of time. It's a little bit messed up. Okay? So a random variable maps to a single number. A random process, each event is actually a function of time. So that's really the only difference, but it's a little, it's a little bit of a mind job if you think about it. Okay? So a random process, which we'll call RP, okay, so we're going to denote that as x of t because we are now indicating that this is a random variable that varies over time. So there is a time dependence on each outcome, okay? So what's actually, what's actually funny or what's actually funky is that the selection of the event, you know, choosing the actual event is random, but once you actually choose the event, that time varying random variable is actually deterministic or that is actually well known. So what is random about a random process is the the fact that you're choosing something at random is what is random. But once you actually choose an outcome, that particular time waveform, that time varying function, stays the same. That's what is known as deterministic, where you actually know what that time varying function is. But the fact that you don't know which one you're going to choose is why it's random. Okay? So the randomness is not associated with the time varying outcome. It's not associated with that function of time. It's associated of choosing which one of those time varying waveforms that you want to choose. Okay, that's the whole point of being random. So remember, that, so the difference between a random variable and a random process is a random variable, you're mapping an outcome to a single number, that number doesn't change. It's independent of time. But with a random process, as soon as you choose one event, that event is a function of time, but that function is well known once you choose that particular outcome. All right? So it's a little bit of a mind job, but it makes sense. And I'll give you a little bit of an example in a little bit. Okay? So here's, a, here's, a great, here's an intuitive example. example. So this is very far-fetched, but it's something that will allow you to understand where random processes come from. So let's say you're at your favorite restaurant, if it's a pub, or if it's a gastropub, or it's, if it's a French restaurant, or an English restaurant, what have you, okay? And you decide to order something new on the item for the very first time. So, you know, you decide to go away from your usual fare, and you have, there's, this, there's this new item on the menu that you haven't seen before, and you want to try it for the first time. This is something that you had never seen before. So we're going to let the random process be the amount of satisfaction or the amount of enjoyment that you are enjoying your particular meal after you bite into the first bite of your food. So as soon as you take your first bite and you start chewing, we're going to map the amount of satisfaction that you experience as a function of time. Right? So there's different ways you can think about this. Right? So let's say you bite into something and it tastes like crap. And if you bite into something, it tastes really good. Or if you bite into something, there, you know, it might... It tastes okay, but you might want to add a couple of ingredients later on in the future. Okay, so the, the, the sensation that you're feeling is completely random, but the satisfaction that you feel once you choose that particular event will not vary as a function of time. Okay, so let's say after experimentation, you know, there's going to be more than one possible outcome, but let's, for, for simplistic cases, let's boil it down to three possible outcomes. Okay, so let T be the amount of time that has elapsed since you 
put the first bite in your mouth and you start chewing. All right. So then let's say after you experiment, you know, uh, you know, there's much experimentation. There's only three possible outcomes. So the first outcome is going to be it tastes like crap. You don't want to eat it anymore. You just want to spit it out and send it back to the waiter. Okay. So that's the first outcome. The second outcome is all right. It it tastes okay, but maybe if you add a little bit of salt or pepper or some ingredient that is missing from what you believe it should be good, if you add that in, then it should be okay. And then the last one is just excellent. You don't you don't want to change anything, and you just have it as it is, and you'll eat the whole plate. So we let x of t. So that waveform, you know, the amount of satisfaction is time varying, but the particular outcome of the horrible taste, for example, we're going to call s of one. Okay, and the good taste where you want to add a little bit of ingredients, you know, and then it'll be okay, will be S of 2. And then finally, the last outcome where it's really good, you don't want to change anything, it's S of 3. Okay, so, so we're going to let S1, S2, and S3 denote the particular outcome, the event, whether it tastes like crap, if it tastes okay, if you want to add a little bit of ingredients to make it good, or if it, it's really good, you don't have to change anything. All right, so X of T of S1 and T of S2 and T of S3 are what the waveform of your satisfaction looks like once you decide whether or not it is good, it is average, or it is bad. Okay? So each outcome is random, but the amount of satisfaction that you feel once you start chewing is deterministic. Right? So once you take your first bite, one of the three outcomes is going to happen, and then these outcomes will vary over time, going from very happy to very sad, maybe because you, know, you ate it too fast and you know, the satisfaction is over, or it satisfied, you know, if it's very quick, or you know, if it's very bad, you spit it out immediately, kind of something like that. Okay, so let's visualize this to have a little bit of an understanding. So well, I've defined the experiment. Let's let's just define you know uh, these three outcomes. Let's say you know let's let's show what these three outcomes look like as a as a function of time. So here is it here it is visualized. Okay, so we've got uh, a bunch of uh, vocabulary that I need to define before I go into the diagram on the right. But the the first term is what we're going to use is called sample space. So the sample space, if you remember from probability, it's the set of all possible outcomes you can choose from, and when you undergo an event, one of these outcomes from the sample space will be chosen. All right? Sample functions are once you decide what outcome or what event you want to choose, then that outcome is a function of time. And that function is called a sample function. All right? So functions of time for those particular outcomes. And x of t, it's what's known as a stochastic or random process. So when people talk about stochastic processes or random processes, they're actually the same thing. All right, stochastic in the fact that it's you know they're, they're synonymous. So when I say stochastic or when I say random, it's completely you know it's the same, All right? And then S sub i is the outcome that you've chosen, whether it, you know it sucks really bad, if it's average, or if it's really good. And then t here is an indication of time, so it's a waveform over time. All right, and so that means x t of S i means that once you decide the outcome that you want, that function of time is deterministic. So in our case, we want to plot the amount of satisfaction that we have over time. Okay. So that's pretty much the diagram. So the sample space here, you're choosing whichever outcome you want. And then once you decide that outcome, these functions are deterministic. So these are pretty much, you know, these are fixed and those are functions of time. And the only thing that is random is the outcome that you choose. So for example, you know, this one is really, really bad. So as soon as you chew it, you know, this hump here means that you're kind of deciding on whether or not it's really good. And then it plummets down saying it really sucks and you spit it out. And then it comes to a point where you're kind of satisfied because that shit's out of your mouth now. All right. So this one here is that, you know what, you're, you're, you're deciding, and then you know what, you know, you're, just, you're still deciding. Is that, you know, it's a little satisfactory, but you're still keeping it in your mouth because you're still deciding what ingredients to add to make it better. And then you spit it out after. All right? This one is that it's really good. You don't want to spit it out at all. So you're going through waves and waves of happiness. All right? And that will be the last outcome. All right? So that's pretty much what a random process is in a nutshell. That's something that is intuitive that you can understand. All right? So more on random processes. So if you actually think about it, if you go back to this waveform, if you choose any point in time, so let's say this point here, let's call this t sub 0, all right? At any point in time, you can consider this to be a random variable, right? Because at any point in time, what's going to happen is that you don't know exactly, at, you know, for each point in time, you don't know exactly what outcome is going to be chosen. So if for, this, for this particular case, if you have one time point we'll call t of 0, then there's three possible things that you could choose from. So at, at some time point, which is t of 0, you can consider that point to be a random variable. Because at that particular time point, you don't know which of them is going to be chosen. So if you actually take a look at the distribution of all those curves at a particular time point, you can consider that particular slice in time to be a random variable. right? So you can choose it. It's, you know, it's mapped between one of three possibilities. Okay, so at any time point t of zero, if we examine all of the time functions that we have, 
you can consider that time point to be a random variable. So in this case, you know, x of t of 0, so your random process sampled at some time. The collection of all of those points over, over all time varying outcomes, you can consider that as a random variable. Okay? Because you actually don't know what, what exactly is going to happen at a certain time. You just know that you know, you're going to choose some event, and once you decide that event, then there's a function that's varying over time. But if you collect all of your time points at one, you know, sorry, if you collect all of your um, you know, uh, amplitudes for each of your waveforms at a particular point in time, you can consider the collection of all those to be a random variable. Right? So at times t1 and t2, like you know, they're two separate times, so let's say at 0.5 seconds or 1.5 seconds, each of those are two separate random variables, all right? So for example, at 0.5 seconds, how exactly are you going to feel after you started chewing, right? Even though we know that there are only three possible type of outcomes, you actually don't know which one at that particular point in time it's going to be. So you can consider each point by itself to be a random variable, all right? Very simple. So let's, let's go through a couple more definitions here. So there's something which we call the mean value function. Okay, so it's defined as mu sub x of t. So you can think of this as taking all of your waveforms, averaging them together, and producing an average waveform. Okay, so this means that when you decide to sample something, this is the average waveform. This is the expected waveform that you're going to see when you sample from your sample space. So what the mean value function says in a nutshell is take every single one of your time varying functions, you know, from 0 to 5, assuming they're all the same. So let's say you've got maybe 50 or 100 or so. Average them all together, and whatever you get, that is what is known as the mean value function. So it's the expected time varying function that you expect once you go through this experiment. Okay, so this notation, e of x of t, is the expected value of your random process. So mu of x of t is e, which is the expected value, and then the random process, which is x of t. So just to summarize, your expected mean value function, and what it does is that it takes a look at all time varying outcomes and it figures out what is the average one out of all of them. Okay, so very, very simple. All right? Were you okay so far? It's pretty, it's pretty simple. All right, good. Okay, good. So uh, just, a, just in, you know, a couple of equations for you, and we'll certainly do some examples later. So if you remember, uh, the, assuming that this is a continuous uh, probability distribution function, all right, if you wanted to find the expected value, you basically find the integral of x times your PDF. You integrate it over all possible values in your PDF. Okay, so that's just for a random variable. For a random process, it's very simple. All you have to do is just replace all the x's with x of t's. Right? So what will happen is that you are integrating, but you still have t to be considered a constant. So when you actually run through this formula, you will get a function of time. And that will be the average or mean value function of your random process over time. Okay, so all you're doing is you're just changing the x's to x of t's. And then this is the PDF that is defined for your random process. So once, so the outcome, as I said, the outcome is random. So the, the, uh, the choice that you want to choose for the particular waveform is going to be subject to a random variable. And that's what is defined here, f of xt. And then when you integrate you know, that over time, uh, not over time, if you integrate that over all possible you know, uh, choices for your random variable, and then you'll have a function of time, and then that's when you stop. Okay, so here's just something to think about. So I just want to talk about a couple of properties because we're going to need the note to know this for later on when we talk about noise analysis. All right, so here's just something to think about. So if you remember the properties for the expected value, let's say we've got two random variables, which are called x and y. Okay, so we've got the following properties. So we have the first property, which is known as linearity. Okay? So basically what that means is that if you have two random variables that are added together, if you want to find the average, it's simply just finding each of the averages individually and just adding them up together. So it's just very simple. So you, the average is a linear operation. Right? So if you take the average of one random variable and the average of another, and if you add them together, it's the same thing as adding up the random variables first and then finding the average when you're done. Okay? There's also scaling too. So if you scale every single outcome in your random variable by a factor of a, it's the same thing as finding the average of it by itself and it's scaling by a when you're done. So that's what's known as scaling. Okay, so it's very simple. Just pull the A out. You know, if you have a random variable, you, if it's scaled by A, just pull it out and uh, apply your average normally and just scale it by A and you're done. Okay? So if you actually use both of these together in, you know, in tandem, let's say we had two scalars A and B. So if I wanted to find the average of two random variables, X and Y, that are scaled by A and B, like so, it's simply just splitting them out first. You've got E of X and E of Y split up. And then each of them is scaled by A and B. So that's simply the average there. So very, very simple. So there's linearity and scaling, and then just use that together to produce this. So this is going to be very important for later when we talk about noise analysis and expected volume. All that. It's going to be very important. All right?
Okay, so now we're starting to get a little uh, a little knee deep into uh, probability stuff now. So this is where people may get lost, but I'm certainly going to slow down and talk you know, and talk about this as slow as I can. Okay, so autocorrelation function. What exactly does that mean? Okay, so autocorrelation means that well, uh, let's see here. So remember that um, you had points time one and time two, and then you can consider a, you know at each of those points the collection of all the amplitudes at each of those points to be two random variables. All right. So what autocorrelation function does is that it will try to find similarity from one point to itself that's shifted over by some time point. So for example here, so you got to, you know it shows how similar two random variables between times point you know time one and time two. Right. So we have two different time points and we have two different random variables associated at each of those time points. Right. So this shows how exactly you know those two random variables that are separated between two instances how similar they are with each other. Okay. So uh, let's call the random variable situated at time point one and the random variable situated at time point two as just x1 and x2, just to just to make it you know short because I don't want to keep writing x of t of one, so they just call it x1 and x2, right? So the autocorrelation function between two random variables, you know, x1 and x2, situated at two time points, t1 and t2, are simply the following here. So I'm not going to ask you to compute this directly. We don't need to do that. I'll talk about a shortcut and how we can do this much later. Okay, but you can compute the autocorrelation function by just simply finding the joint, the integral of the joint PDF. So you've got two random variables, x1 and x2, in terms of you know the, those actual variables themselves. And then you have the joint PDF that defines between them both. So the autocorrelation is the expected value of both random variables, x1 and x2, multiplied together. Okay? So uh, you have some time point, which is t1, and usually t2 is some time point that is you know, some offset away from your initial point, t1. So for example, sometimes you may want to take a look at the autocorrelation from time point to say 1 to 3. So that means that your shift is basically 2. Okay, so usually you have your ending time point to be where your beginning time point is by added with some offset. So if you want to go from 1 to 3, then the offset, which we'll use as tau, will be 2. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to find that autocorrelation between two random variables situated between you know, time points 1 and 2. And then time points 2 is it's, it's some offset that is far away from, not far away, but it's, it's some offset that is away from t of 1. Okay, so this guy here, f of x1 and x2, whatever, that is the joint PDF between the two random variables x1 and x2. Okay, so it tells you how similar those two random variables at both those different time points are, you know, as similar as possible. So I'm going to let you think about this for a little bit. So if you made your, you know, time points to be very, very small, so let's say you chose one point to be 1, and then one point to be 1.00001, for example. Because of the shift, because there's a very, very tiny shift, you'd assume that the closer the shift is, the more similar those random variables would be from each other. Kind of makes sense, right? Because if you think of each time wave as a continuous time function, if your shift was right dead on, if it was right, at e if it was right equal to zero, then those random variables would be exactly the same, right? But then as you start varying your time wave, as you start going far and far away, what will happen is that you would expect it to be less similar because, you know, if, when you, let's say, move like one millisecond away from one second, because the time points are so small, you'd expect that the random variables would be sim pretty much similar. But as you start moving farther and farther away, you'd expect the random variables to show less similarity if the process was truly random. Okay? So here's a quick illustration. So we're going to let xt and yt be two random processes that you're going to see on the right. So this one on the left is the first random process, which, which we'll call x of t. And the second one here on the right, it's the second random process, which we'll call y of t. Okay? And you'll notice that one of them is not varying as much as the other one. Okay? So x of t has, a very, has very slowly time-varying outcomes. And it seems to be deterministic, especially when you make the shift very small. Okay? So usually we have two time points, t1 and t2, that are separated by some distance, which we'll call tau. And if you take a look at the random process of y, you'll see that there's a little bit more randomness. All right? So it, you'd, assume, you'd assume that this is more random than the previous one. So we're going to let t1 and t2 be some time points where t2 is just t1 with an offset of tau. And then we're going to let x1 and x2 be the random variables that are situated for x at t1 and t2. So at t1, this is a random variable. So there's four possible outcomes. We don't know which outcome that'll be. And then the same thing for t of 2 as well. And we're going to let you know, y1 and y2 be the random variables that are associated at time points 1 and 2 for the random process of y. So if you take a look at the bottom, this is the autocorrelation function as a function of the shift. So as you make the shift of tau be larger, then what will happen is that you will see that at least for the 
X, you know, for the X random process, because this is slowly varying, you'd expect that if you made the, you know, the time lags to be larger, right? Because this is slowly varying, you'd expect that, you know, there is, you know, the similarity will start to gradually decrease. All right, so because this is slowly varying, you know, this shift between here and here, because there's not much of a change, you'd expect that the, you know, the uh, random variables between this and this point are going to be slightly similar. And then as you start moving farther and farther away, you'll see that the similarity starts to decrease. But then when you take a look at this one, this is the process for y of t, you'll see that there are random fluctuations and it's random, you know, it's varying with a very high frequency. So you'd expect that as you start, you know, making the distance of, you know, of the, of the time lag to be larger, you'd expect that the similarity would drop very, very uh, quickly. Right, it kind of makes sense, right? Because you can certainly tell that you know the, the random variable distribution at this point t1 and t2 are pretty much they're not exactly the same. So that's why you'd expect that the autocorrelation function, as you make the time like bigger, you'd expect that the similarity were to decay a lot quicker than its counterpart for x. All right. So this is pretty much what I summarized from the previous, uh, you know, what I just talked about before. So since your time point t2 is equal to some time point t1 plus some sort of shift. This means that the difference in time is just simply the second point minus the first, right? So this tau denotes the offset away from t of 1. So the bottom here, as I talked about, it shows the autocorrelation for each random variable at each particular, you know, at each point in time, right? The, you know, the, the collection between uh, t1 and t2. So as you make the time lag very large, you would expect that there's no more similarity between the two time points. And then for the autocorrelation function at x, because the outcomes are slowly varying, you'd expect that the similarity is going to be, it's going to decay a little more slowly. All right? And then similarly for the random process of y, because there's such a huge variation, you'd expect that as you make the time distances bigger, you'd expect that the decay would be much quicker. OK? Any questions here? No? Are you sure? I know probability sucks, but I'm trying to make this as easy and as palatable as possible. All right? This is basically your, your, your uh, first semester course summarized in about an hour. All right? I'm trying to make it as palatable as possible. OK, so there's different categories for random processes. Like, so random processes can be classified into two different categories. So there are what are known as stationary random processes and non-stationary random processes. So stationary processes are those where their statistical characteristics do not change over time. So a good example would be noise. All right? So as you make the... Um, you know, as you make the time lag to be very large, you'd expect that for noise, it doesn't matter what the time lag is. You'd expect that the random variables at those particular points to be completely non-similar at all. So if that's the case, then you have what's known as a stationary random process. For a non-stationary random process, that means that as you make the, you know, the time lag between one point and another, if you make that difference, you know, to be larger and larger, the actual statistical characteristics will actually change over time. So for example, when you're chewing on your food, there are certain points of time where you're going to feel happy, there are certain points of time where you're going to feel sad. With noise, it doesn't change as you make the time varying, you know, bigger or smaller. It's going to stay the same no matter what. Okay? So for stationary processes, those time varying waveforms at different points in time will have the same mean, the same standard deviation, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this means that the autocorrelation of that particular random process, if it's stationary, that means that the autocorrelation will only depend on the time lag. So that means that if you can represent your autocorrelation function not as a function of two time points, but as a function of delay, so given one particular time point, how much delay do you add? If you can represent the autocorrelation function just as a function of your time lag, then that means that it is a stationary random process. Okay? So for non-stationary random processes, those time varying waveforms do not have the same mean and standard deviation. So for each point in time, you'll you're going to see a different mean and a different standard deviation, you know, mostly. Okay, so that's the difference between stationary and non-stationary. So here's where we talk about white sense stationary processes. So a white sense stationary process, or WSS for short, is a stationary process that is special because it satisfies the following two constraints. Okay, so the mean value function of your random process is constant. So it doesn't matter what that constant is. If you can show that your random process, the mean value function, is a constant value, that's the first piece of the puzzle. And the second piece of the puzzle we already talked about. So if you can show that the autocorrelation function uh, can, you know, it only depends on the time lag, then that's the second piece of the puzzle and you're done. Okay, so the mean value function evaluates to be constant at all points of time t in your mean value function. And the autocorrelation function only depends on your time lag tau. Okay, so for example, the autocorrelation function at times 3 and 6 
is going to be the same as the autocorrelation function between time 6 and 9. As long as the difference in time is the same, in this case it's going to be 3, because th 6 minus 3 or 9 minus 6 is equal to 3. If you can show that it doesn't matter where you start, when you move over by a certain delay, if you can show that the autocorrelation function only depends on time lag, then you pretty much solve the other part of showing that this is a WSS process. All right? Okay, so we're going to talk about power spectral density. So this is actually something you probably have not seen before. So up to white sense stationary, that's probably what you're familiar with. But when we get on, this is new material now. Okay, so power spectral density. So the power spectral density, or the PSD, of a random process, what it does is that it actually calculates the frequency components of a random process. So we define this as S of X, so power spectral density of the random process X in terms of F or omega, whichever one you want. Okay, so th you can't blindly take the Fourier transform of a random process because you actually don't know which function of time you're going to choose, and then you apply a random process, you know, apply a Fourier transform on that. It doesn't make any sense, right? With the Fourier transform, you know what the time signal is ahead of time, and then you apply your Fourier transform on that. Because this is a random process, you don't know which time function you're going to choose. So apl blindly applying the Fourier transform by itself is not going to be good. You could try to do it for every single function that you have, but theoretically there are random processes that have an infinite number of combinations. So if you wanted to try to apply the Fourier transform in infinite number of combinations, then good luck, because you can't do it. All right? So what you can do also, what you can do, however, is you can take a look at the autocorrelation function, and there is a theorem where if you take the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, then that actually gives you the power spectral density. So for non-stationary processes, there is no such thing as a power spectral density. So you have to make sure that your um, uh, random process is stationary, and then you can take the power spectral density of that before you continue. All right? So this is what's known as the wiener kinchin theorem. So basically what I just talked about is exactly that. So if you took the Fourier transform of your autocorrelation function, especially knowing that that autocorrelation function only varies in terms of your time lag, then that is the power spectral density. So the Fourier transform, either an f or either an omega of your autocorrelation function, is simply the power spectral density. So this is just your standard Fourier transform. So you're taking the integral from minus infinity to infinity, and then if you're taking a look in terms of f, it's e to the power minus g to the power f tau, because we're actually integrating with respect to tau, because the tau is the actual time variable here. And then you do the same thing for omega, but instead of 2 pi f, you just represent it as omega. So these are just your standard Fourier, Fourier transform definitions, but tau is the actual time variable here, not t. Okay. So we can also determine what the autocorrelation function is from the power spectral density. So you can actually go backwards. So let's say you have the power spectral density. How exactly do you figure out what the autocorrelation function is? You just find the inverse. Okay, so it's just applying the inverse Fourier transform on the power spectral density, and then you get what the autocorrelation function is. So all you have to do is change the negative signs, so you're going from minus to positive, and then you're integrating with respect to the frequency variable that you are using. So if you integrate, if you're representing in terms of f, you integrate with respect to f. If you're representing in terms of omega, you represent, you know, you integrate with respect to omega. And then you have to make sure that there's a 1 over 2 pi factor, because that's what the omega has. That's the, that's the um, uh, constraint. Okay? So, but the point here is that you can go back and forth. So if you have the autocorrelation function, you take the Fourier transform, you get the power spectral density. If you have the power spectral density, take the inverse, you get the autocorrelation function. So that's what's known as the wiener kinchin theorem. Okay? So here are some properties that are shared between the autocorrelation function and the power spectral density. All right? So if you evaluate your autocorrelation function, or sorry, not autocorrelation, if you evaluate your power spectral density at f is equal to 0 or omega is equal to 0, basically what you're doing is you're just finding the total area that is bound by the autocorrelation function. So if you substitute f or omega is equal to 0, what's going to happen is that you have e to the power of 0, which is 1. So if you, you know, specify f is equal to 0 or omega, you are basically just finding the total area. And this is actually the average value of your autocorrelation function. But that's, you know, you don't need to know that, right? So the autocorrelation function exhibits a peak at tau is equal to zero, which makes sense because if you have your random variable and if you don't move it in time, if you take it, if you have two points that are exactly the same, you'd expect that those random variables exhibit the most similarity. And then as you start veering away from that actual delay, you'd expect that there's a decrease in similarity. Right? So this implies that two random variables seen at both time points where they're both equal, they're going to be the most similar. So you're, basically what you're doing is you're comparing against yourself. And if you do that, that should give you the most similarity. Right. So here's the next property. So the peak of the autocorrelation function, so this is actually not the average value, I'm sorry, it's the actual power associated with the random process. So if you took your autocorrelation function and substituted time lag is equal to zero, that actually gives you what power that actually uh, that random process actually exhibits. 
Okay, so the power of a random process is simply the expected value of, you know, remember this was x of t1 and x of t2. Because t1 and t2 are basically the same, you're basically just squaring that random process, and that's what's happening here. And then all you have to do is just substitute your tau is equal to zero into your autocorrelation, and then you get the actual power of that random process. So e of x squared of t is just the mean square value of your random process. Okay, so this also implies that if you wanted to take a look at in terms of the power spectral density, so if you substituted you know, rx equals equal to tau, or tau is equal to zero, remember that e to the zero is going to be one. So if you took the area under the curve right, for your autocorrelation function, actually that means that not autocorrelation function, if you actually take the area of the power spectral density, that total area also gives you the power as well. So there's actually two ways to actually determine the total power. Either you have the autocorrelation function, where you substitute tau is equal to zero, or you have your power spectral density and you just find the total area that's bounded between each of the amplitudes with the horizontal axis. So either one of those will give you the power of the random process. Okay. So the next point is that the power spectral density is non-negative. So that means that you shouldn't expect any values that are below the horizontal axis. It doesn't make any sense. So for all frequency values, either f or omega, you'd expect that the power spectral density is non-negative. So it's either zero or positive. Okay. And finally, the autocorrelation function and the power spectral densities are even symmetric. So that means that if you were to put a mirror, a vertical mirror, on the vertical axis, you'd expect that there's just a mirror copy between one and another. So on the right side, if you were to do a mirror reflection to the left side, you'd expect that the shapes are the same, because that's basically what even symmetric is. So here's a quick concrete example, and then we'll take a little bit of a break. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to determine whether or not this random process is white sand stationary. So let's actually do some calculations now. Okay, so this is a random process, which is defined as x of t, and then we have some cosine wave, you know, with some carrier frequency t, but the random variable that is associated with this random process is the phase. So this means that you have some cosine wave that is varying at some frequency omega c, but we actually don't know what the actual phase of that particular wave is going to be. Once you decide on the phase, then that, fa you know, that function varies over time, and that becomes fixed. So this is actually a good, you know, it's a very simple random process where you actually don't know what the phase is. But once you figure out what the phase is, then that function varies over time very normally. Okay? So we have this random process. It's varying in terms of time, but we know that the phase is uniformly distributed such that there is a random phase between 0 and 2 pi. Okay? So if you recall from your probability class, you know that a uniformly distributed random variable has the following PDF. So between values A and B, you know that that PDF value is simply 1 over B minus A, and everything else is 0. So you can think of it as a box that spans between A and B with a height of 1 over B minus A. Okay? So it's one of the most simplest uh, random variables that you can have. So for example, here, uh, if you wanted to flip a coin or flip a die, that means that between you know, 0 and 1, when you're flipping a coin, you'd expect that the, um, not 0 and 1, yeah, but you'd expect that, you know, the, uh, the you know, the, uh, I guess the, in this case, the, the height is going to be 1, I guess. So that means that it's a, because each value is the same, that means that each outcome is pretty much equally likely. So don't actually, in this case, don't actually use the PDF as, you know, an actual, like, you know, probability value because that doesn't make any sense for continuous time. But the fact that each value is equal in between ranges 0 and 1 or A and B means that it's fair or it's equally likely to choose any one of them. Okay? So therefore, uh, you know, 1 over B minus A here, because we're going from 0 to 2 pi and there's a random phase element between 0 and 2 pi, we'd expect that the height of the PDF is 1 over 2 pi. Okay? So if you remember what the conditions were for a white sense stationary random process, there are two things you have to check. The first case is you have to make sure that the mean value function is constant. The second case is when you calculate the autocorrelation function, you have to make sure that the, it only varies with respect to the time delay. There is uh, no time dependence other than just the delay between you know, one point and another. Okay? So let's figure out what the mean value function is, and let's verify that this is constant. Okay, so let's actually do that right now. So this is the equation for finding what the mean value function is. So it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity, so all possible values. You substitute your random process here, x of t, and then you define the PDF for that particular random variable that is associated with that random process. So x of t is basically this guy over here, and the PDF is 1 over b minus a, which is 1, to two, 1 over 2 pi. And remember that you're only going from a to b, in this case, which is 0 to 2 pi. Okay? We can take the a and we can take the 2 pi and bring it on the outside. So this means that you're integrating from between 0 and 2 pi of a cosine function. Because the cosine is even, 
and you're doing it over one period, that means that the total area would cancel out between the top peaks and the bottom, so you, the value is zero. So the mean value function of this random process is zero, which is fine. So that's the first situation. We've covered that the mean value function gives you a constant value, in this case it's zero, right? The next one here is going to be a little more involved. So this is actually finding what the autocorrelation function is between, uh, you know, uh, let's see here. So between time points t1 and t of 2. Okay, so remember the random process at times t1 is simply a cos omega ct, but instead of t, you got t1. And then you have your random phase here. And then you do the same thing for the random process at t2. You replace t with t2, and that's fine. Okay, so if you remember the double angle formulas here, if you multiply two cosines of different arguments, it's the same thing as saying, you know, um, if you had, you know, cos A and cos B, it's the same thing as cos A minus B and cos A plus B. And then you have to make sure you scale by a half for each of those. So if you let this thing be A and this thing be B, if you did A minus B, the phases will cancel. So you're left with omega CT1 minus omega CT2, but we factor out on omega C, so that's going on here. And then we take these, this one and this one, we add them together. So we see that T1 and T2 have a common omega C, so that's one over here. And these two thetas will add up, so you get two, okay? And then because we, you know, this is the expected value, so what's happening here is that we are first taking out this a squared. Remember that, linear, that scaling part. So the a squared comes out, and the product of 2 gives you a factor of a half. So that's why you have an a squared over 2 over here. And because we're adding two things inside the expected value, you can split them up, as we did here. Okay? And then when you actually integrate, what's going to happen here is that, remember, you're integrating with, with respect to theta. So there's no theta term over here. This is constant. So the expected value of a constant is just a constant. And we've already solved this from the previous part. So the expected value, when you're integrating over one period, right, it doesn't matter. You're just basically, you're just increasing the amount of periods by two. So if you do this, this one goes away. So we're left with just this first term, which is here. Okay. Also, we can flip this because, you know, cosine's even function. So if you meant t1 minus t2, it's the same thing as t2 minus t1, right? So this here, this, we represented this as our time light. Remember, you have to represent tau as being t2 minus t1. So just replace this with tau and you're done. Okay. So the autocorrelation function only depends on the time lag. So because we've solved this, and we've solved the fact that uh, the mean value function is zero, that means that this is a white sense stationary random process. All right? This is one last example. I'm just going to keep the power spectral density, and then we'll take a break. All right? So here's another example. So using the previous example, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the power spectral density now of this random process. Also, we're going to calculate what the total power is. So if you remember what the random process was, you have some cosine wave with some random phase between 0 and 2 pi. It's uniformly distributed. If you remember from before, we calculated the autocorrelation function to be a squared over 2 coso omega single tau. And remember that this represents your carrier frequency. If you wanted to do it in terms of hertz or f, you just take omega c divided by 2 pi. And if you wanted to figure out what the power spectral density of this is, you just have to calculate what the Fourier transform is using tau as your time variable. Okay? So this is very simple. Remember, the Fourier transform of a cosine wave is just two impulses, right? One that's centered, in this case, at omega c, and one that's centered at minus omega c. And it's going to be scaled by either a squared over 4 or a squared pi over 2, depending on whether you're looking at it in terms of f or omega. All right? So here we go. So here's the power spectral density. If you want, let's take a look at it in terms of omega. All right. So the Fourier transform of a cosine wave is pi and then two delta centered at plus minus omega c. So the pi comes out. This is what we get. And if you do it in terms of f, it's just one over two. So you have a squared over two, and then when you divide by two again, you get four, and then we have those two impulses. So let's actually show how to figure out what the actual power is. So there's two ways you can calculate the power. The first way is to use the autocorrelation function by itself and just substitute zero into it and then you get what the power is. So in this case, you have, you know, you already know what the autocorrelation function is. It's this guy, and then we just have to substitute t is, you know, tau is equal to zero in. Cos of zero gives you one, and then you're left with a squared over two, all right? The next one is going to be a little more difficult, but it should be doable. You're basically just finding the total area of the power spectral density bound between the horizontal axis, and I'll do that for you now. Okay, so this is finding the total area. So if you want to figure out what the power, you know, the power that is given, you all you have to do is find what the total area of the power spectral density is. So all you have to do is for just find the total area. Okay, so in this case, substitute what your power spectral density is. And remember, because integrals are linear, you can split this up into two. So I can take this a squared pi over two and bring this outside. So these pi's cancel. So the pi on the top and the pi on the bottom cancel. You have two times two, and that gives you four on the bottom, and then the a squared comes out here. Okay, so once you have this, you have two integrals. If you remember, the integral under a impulse function is just simply equal to one. All right, so you have one here, 
and one here. So one plus one is two. Two divided by four gives you a squared over two. Okay, so a squared over two is the power there. We can also do it in terms of f if you're a little more comfortable in terms of f. So we can do that as well here. So let's also check this in terms of f. So our auto, you know, our power spatial density was this guy here. It was a squared over four. Bring the a squared over four out, right? There's no one over two pi here. If you remember from the inverse Fourier transform of f, you find these integrals. This is one here, one here. One plus one is two. Two divided by four is a half. So you get a squared over two. Okay. And that's it. So there's two ways to do it. Either finding it through the autocorrelation function or finding the total area of the power spectral density, and both of them should give you the same results. All right? Okay, so I'm going to take a break here. Let's come back and we'll talk about uh, noise uh, in a little bit. Okay?